Welcome to the Enon Church. At the Enon Church, we endeavor to lift Christ, to seek the salvation of the unsaved, to foster a unity of faith, and promote a more excellent way of living. We want to welcome you into today's virtual worship experience. Tune in now to the virtual sanctuary where we go to join Dr. Gregory L. Pollard and the entire Eden family. Good morning, good morning, and welcome to this another opportunity for virtual worship. I am most certainly excited and I am delighted that you're staying connected to us and your return happens to be our concern. Let me say that I'm asking you to continue to pray for all those persons who are sick, shed in, those persons who are bereaved, those persons who are waiting to be healed and delivered. I'd like to take this opportunity to express my sincerest appreciation to each and every one of you for how you've shown love to me and my family, um, supported me uh, and my family during this time of bereavement. Most certainly as I laid to rest, my only brother I laid him to rest on this past Thursday, and you were there. You were there before in the times of his sickness. Uh, I wanted to be responsible. It would have really been irresponsible had I opened the doors of the church, and I know that the floodgates, this would have been a full place. But there are you who looked at it and added comments online. Let me thank you for adhering to my request to ensure the safety of all of us. And that's really been the dynamics of what I've attempted to do throughout this whole entire pandemic. Over the last two years almost, we have sought to ensure that we have a place of safety. And I'm grateful to each and every one of you for all you did and all you did to make the homegoing celebration of my brother, Reginald Bernard Pollard, a grand and great uh, opportunity for us just to Say uh, and give him a salute and say good night to my brother. Let me say that I'm grateful for each and every ministry that was in place. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks to all of you for your prayers, your calls, your text messages, uh, the meals, your donations to the JLP scholarship ministry and to our church in memory and in memorial of my brother. Thank you so very kindly and I am very much appreciative and I am indebted to you because I believe that during this time that it becomes a reciprocatory process that we must undergird, strengthen, and hold and help one another. Let me say I also ask you to continue to pray for Deacon Tommy Townsend who is gravely ill. We are asking you to pray for him. Pray for Mother Rita Coker who is gravely ill and has been admitted to hospice. We are asking you to continue to pray for the two of them. Let me say congratulations to Sabri Cynthia Olatosin. Let me thank you, Sabri, for the commitment that you've shown over the years to the Atlanta Police Department. And so let me say to you, 30 years of service. She celebrated her birthday this month and then retired after a distinguished service of 30 years with the police department of the APD. And let me just say to you, Sabri, we love you and appreciate you. We've used uh, you for many uh, avenues to bless this ministry while you serve in that capacity. And now we salute you and we pray God's blessings over you. Let me say to you, if you're in need of counseling, you're in need of some prayer, you're in need of knowing the plan of salvation, that God has for your individual life. Let me just reassure you of an irrefutable fact that God has a plan for your life. He has a plan and that plan is contained within his holy writ. And we wanna show you what that plan is. If you would like to know the plan of salvation for your life, text Enon Salvation. If you're in need of prayer, text Enon Prayer. Or if you're in need of some financial assistance or some support, food, clothing, whatever you counseling, whatever you need during this time, just text Enon Support. And you can do all of that by texting those dynamics to the key that you see on the screen, the key number and the key word 54244, 54244. If you wish to join the ministry, most certainly that is an opportunity that many have taken because we have been in this pandemic and not been able to get in the sanctuary, you have joined the ministry by texting Join Enon to the number 
54244. Join Enon 54244. We have members now all across the globe, and we are appreciative. Whenever you look in the comments, you'll see some of them commenting that they are now connected to the ministry in Virginia, connected to the ministry in Chicago, Philadelphia, all over, and we are excited that now we have a virtual church. I'm appreciative for that connection. Let me also say there are three dynamics that you can give your tithe offering, Brothers Keepers offering, JLP scholarship, or Pastors Love offering. Whatever you wish to do, you can do that by going to our website, going to the online giving portal, and sharing your gifts by using your credit card, or you can go and text Enon MG to the number 54244, Enon Mobile Giving. 54244, or you can mail it to us at the address that you see on the screen, 3550 Enon Road, Atlanta, Georgia, 30349. Let me say to you, I am excited today that the Lord has deposited a word within us that I believe will resonate and revive your soul. And just stay tuned while we get ready. Get up in that house. Get up in that house. Come on. <laughs> Get up in the house. Matter of fact, you ought to make some noise in the house. Get yourself together. And let's go. Oh, man. Let, let's go. Two. What? Worship. Oh! 
eternal and gracious God, our Father, we thank you for the benevolence of your mercies. We thank you for your kindness, and we thank you for how you blessed us with another opportunity to lift, to magnify, to praise, and extol your holy and righteous name. We thank you for this fourth Sunday of this new month in a whole new year. We thank you that you've given us a day today that we've never seen before. We ask now that you give us a spirit of praise that we would cause the nostrils and the rise and a sweet savor that you are pleased with our worship. God, I pray now that you blot out our sins and transgressions, remove everything that's not like you in order that we might hear what you would have to say. God, I pray that you would bless your people and that as a result of the preached gospel that they will know that they have everything they need through the total sufficiency of your son, Jesus Christ. We honor you, God, and we give you thanks in the mighty, matchless, majestic, and moving and mandating name of your son, Jesus the Christ. God, we thank you. Have mercy on me. Don't hold my sins against your people. Let us hear clearly what you have to say. In Jesus' name, God, we thank you. And we say amen. Make it a rhema word right now. Mm -hmm. Jesus, keep me, me near the cross that's oppressed shall find fountain and is free freedom a hill land shrink flow
shall find I'm looking for rest One of these days until my raptured soul shall find rest beyond. And what they were singing about was that they were going to go beyond the place of death, Jordan's River. I told you about that last week, how he took Elijah all the way from Bethel and Jericho and Jordan beyond the river, Lord Jesus. Beyond the river. You know, they used to say that um, Rolls Royces will be a dollar at Jordan River because they can't cross over. <laughs> Beyond the river. Mother will be there waiting, but she can't help me to cross. Father will be there, but he can't help me to cross. Jordan River, chilly and cold. Chill my body, but not my soul. Jesus was going to help me cross that river. Today, I thought that I would just share some gems and nuggets with you that would be beneficial to move us and to catapult us to the next dimension. There are times, even on the road to success, even on the road to progress and development to the destiny that God has desired for us, we oftentimes get weary. Here's one of the texts that I read when that weary moment comes. Song number 30, verse number 1, all the way to verse 12. Song 30, verse 1, all the way to verse 12. I'm reading the New International Version of the Hebrew context of the Bible. It may differ from the one you hold, but in conglomeration, it means the same. Listen to what it says. I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies, watch this, gloat over me. Lord, my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. You kept me, God, right there from going to hell. That's really what he's saying. Sing the praises of the Lord. You, his faithful people, praise his holy name. Verse 4. Verse 5 says, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. And that simply says that the night has a curfew. Watch this. Look at verse 6. And so when I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. Verse 7, the Lord, when, when you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. Verse number 8. To you, Lord, I called to the Lord and cried for mercy. Verse 9, what is gain if I am silenced? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Watch. Will you proclaim, will it proclaim your faithfulness? Verse number 10, hear the Lord and be merciful to me. Lord, he says, hear, Lord. Be merciful to me. Lord, be my help. Look at verse 11. You turn my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. That's going to bless us later on. Here's the finality of the reading of verse number 12. It says, it says that my heart may sing your praises. And I will not be silent. My Lord, my God, I will praise you forever. I want to talk about just simply about this, the God who turned things around. The God who turned things around. Let me just stand here and confess to you and say, ladies and gentlemen, after eulogizing my father, after eulogizing my mother, and this week, after eulogizing my only brother, 
Now the sun somehow rises differently. Grief, ladies and gentlemen, is nothing more than an expression of love. And I often had to learn as a result of death invading the domains of my family. Long before that, I always taught that grief was something that you get over. But my mother told me two days prior to her moving from this place to a new place that there are some things that's going to happen that you will never get over, but you have to learn how to manage. And so grief is nothing more than an expression of love. And because it is, I don't ever want to get rid of the love that I want to express to my family. And so it is, I had to learn how to manage it. Ladies and gentlemen, the home of the late lamented Paul Lawrence Dunbar, a noted African-American poet, is open to the public in Dayton, Ohio. And Paul Lawrence Dunbar had died at the age of 33, and at that age of 33, the prime of his life, really because of tuberculosis, when Dunbar died, his mother left his room just as he left it when he left it. Hear me when I say that, not she didn't touch a single thing. Actually, the room became a shrine for her and she went into the long stage of grief that she could not manage. Watch that. And at the desk of Paul Lawrence Dunbar was the last poem that he had written what would have been the priceless possession, last writings of Paul Lawrence Dunbar was left on the desk in the sunlight because of the radiance from the window. And at her death, her friends discovered in the room those items and only the thing that was really absolutely legible was the date of the writing of the poem. It was done in the last week of his life. Yes, you see, the paper had set in the sunlight for several years and the light had bleached the ink and the words so much so until it was not legibly or visibly able to be viewed. And so here's the thing, the poem, the poem was destroyed unfortunately because of his beloved mother had entered a stage of mourning and depression for a long time that she never really had an opportunity to learn how to manage. Watch this. She never lifted the pages from the, the desk and the depth of her beloved son caused her to never recover wholly back to her life routine and if I stay in a place of mourning what I'm trying to tell you if I stay in a place of mourning we will lose much of life if you stay in a place of mourning you'll lose much of life and I know I'm not just talking to me I'm talking to someone else because if we stay in mourning too long we will lose the rhythm of life that helps us step to the beat of the Jesus Christ life that he desires for us to live. If we stay in mourning too long, we become deaf to the music that God wants to play. But if we stay in mourning too long, we lose the desire and the joy to dance again to life's most melodious music. If we mourn too long, if mourning becomes a way of life, we become so paralyzed by pain and grief that it would not let us go. Life becomes an island of isolation. Hear me when I tell you, and really it becomes a place where you feel secure in insulation and we are cut off from the fragrances of life that contain the sense of hope and renewal. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'm trying to convey to you, but here is something very powerful. The reason why I run to this book of song when I really need some encouragement, but this particular book talks today and it speaks to us it speaks to someone today can you hear what God is saying did you hear the words of the text or did you see them as they were flashed on the screen let me announce it again in verse number 11 God can turn your mourning into dancing I think I just said enough to really give the benediction because you turn my mourning into dancing you put off 
my sackcloth and put on gladness. That, that is the testimony, ladies and gentlemen, of King David that in song, in this particular song today, because, and it can be ours as well. You can rise from the ashes of your morning. You can pick yourself up off the floor of stumbling and you can find a renewal place for life of rejection, a life of rejection and frustration does not have to be the epitaph of your life on the tombstone at your final burial. In other words, you can dance again. Tell somebody you can dance again. You can dance again. You can dance again. You can dance again. You can get in step with the music of life and the symphony of the band of life has a song for you. You ever, you, ever, you ever been at a place and when you are in that place, you ever been at a place that you were in a low place, that you were in a place you really could not really digest and ha have an opportunity to enjoy life at its best and then you heard some music. Music will soothe the soul. It'll change the mood. And so every now and then, oh, that's my song. In life, ladies and gentlemen, I must convey to you that there is a song that God wants you to hear. Tell somebody God wants you to dance again. He wants you to dance again. Here is the thesis for this particular somatic presentation. No matter what you have gone through, no matter how low you have sunk, God wants to turn it around. He wants to turn it around, ladies and gentlemen. He wants to turn it around. This song has so much connection to be sung, and it really sets the tone because this is a song of dedication of a house. I want you to get that perhaps the temple or perhaps even David's house but this song ends up being one of thanksgiving as well because David is thankful for what God has done. And let me just tell you, whenever I get myself in a dark, dismal, and bleak and vague place when I don't know which way to turn and my back is against the wall, I just rejoice in the fact about what God has done because I remember that God is always up to something in our lives David is grateful for where God has brought him from and what God has brought him through and David joyously he's joyous because he was been in a dark place but now God has shined his evanescent of light first thing David says to us is number one here it is and this is point number one God he says in verse number one two and three he says, God, you lifted me. God, you lifted me. And can I just tell you, when God lifts you, ain't nothing nobody else can do to push you down. He says in verse number one, I will destroy thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up. Has, thou hast made my foes not to rejoice over me. Verse 2, O oh Lord, my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. Verse 3, Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave, the place of the dead. Thou hast kept me alive, and I should not go down to the pit. Let me just share with you that over my foes, he says. And what he's saying when he says, over my foes, he's saying, God, you kept me over my opposition. And so David had some foes in life, and we learn more about that according to Psalm 23. Because he says, he prepareth a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And so he's a military man. And so he not only has men who are enemies, he's got militaries who are enemies because, but out of all the foes and oppositions that are not in the form, matter of fact, you got to remember, every foe that you face is not really from a perspective of being a person. Paul said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. Sometimes it's the enemy in us that's the greatest foe. Sometimes we wrestle with ourselves because God has forgiven us from stuff that we won't release ourselves from. Tell somebody you can dance again. There is the foe of insecurity. Not only the foe of opposition, but there's a foe of insecurity, believing that we are not good enough. Can I just tell you, you are good enough 
You are good enough. I want to encourage you today. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. You are good enough. You're good enough because we've been told that it's so many times that we are not good enough that it, it's in our ear, that it becomes a part of our mind. Now it's a part of our spirit and therefore it becomes of what we hear and what we heard all the time. Be careful what you allow to be digestively intaken into your ear tunnel. Listen what he says. Not only opposition, not only because of insecurity, but then there, there's a foe of rejection. Anybody ever been rejected? There's a foe of rejection being denied and having so many no's in life that no is what you expect. You had so many no's that you expect everything is going to be a no so you don't ask no more. There is a foe of fear, there's a foe of frustration, and there's a foe of failure. But every failure is not a final. Sometimes God lets you fail because what you were getting ready to succeed in was not what God wanted you to have. Sometimes God lets you fall because he wants to be the one to pick you up so that you'll know when you got where you were going, you didn't get there by yourself. High five somebody in the house and tell them every failure is not a final. Wow, man, listen, somebody need to hear that because you failed at something. That means you're going to be better than the person that didn't fail. You're going higher than they've been. We all have some foes, foes of insecurity, foes of opposition, foes of frustration, foes of failure, foes of rejection, foes of failure. We all have some foes. So, we, so you must be a foe fighter. You got to be a foe fighter. And there are some foes you can't fight by yourself. You must be a full fighter. You must have an antidote against the full physician. That's Pollard's word, full physicians. Here are some suggestions for full fighters. You got to be able to speak to yourself. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. You got to be able to speak to yourself and say, I'm blessed and highly favored. I'm an apple of God's eye. I'm saved by his grace to be a workman of good works. Listen, God can turn what is against you in another direction. Tell somebody God can turn it in another direction. Tell them he can turn it in another direction. Watch this. God can abort what has been designed to, to put you in a place of harm. Watch this. God can circumvent the wheel of negative circumstances and navigate situations that had disaster and destruction written all over them to be delivered to you. He can lift you out. Watch this. That's what he says. Number one, he says, God is in, this is what he says in short. David says in Psalm 30, Psalm 30, he says, God is a God who is a God of, he's in the lifting business. <laughs> When things get too heavy, he's in the lifting business. He, he's, he's in the lifting business. Tell, tell, touch somebody and just tell three people real quick. He's in the lifting business. He's in the lifting business. He's in the lifting business. Watch this. Now, here, here's number two. He can lift you out, number one. But here's number two. Not only can God lift you out, because see, here's the point. If I'm lifted out of this situation, because it's in the same area, and the demographics and the atmospheric process has not changed, he can lift me over this. But I'm still on the same surface. Watch, watch. But not only can God lift you over, but he can lift you over, over. <laughs> what I'm trying to say, those things that you can't get over, even when God changes the place you're in, he can lift you over what you think you can't get over. Tell somebody he's a God who will lift you over. Ladies and gentlemen, please hear me. Please hear me. Please hear me. When you are, when you are a child of God, there is no exemption from foes, fears, and frustration. Don't you ever think that just because you've developed a relationship with God that you're not going to be in a place that you're dealing with foes, fears, and frustration. God gives no exemption, but he gives encouragement. God gives no immunity for the factions of life, but God gives inspiration to get over, to get through, and to get beyond. 
God does not promise a life of perfection, but he does promise a life. He does promise a life of provision. <laughs> so that means that no matter where I am, no matter what situation, God is going to provide because he can turn things around. Watch this. God has done a lot in your life that's been aiding and really been adding up. It's been aiding you to help things add up. It's all a setup so you could step up and make a difference. Because God does not make dead investment. He blesses us to be blessings. Yeah, everything you've been through, you've been set up. Come on, shout somebody, shout. You've been set up, you've been set up. You've been set up. All the hell you've been through in your life that, that, that you didn't expect, you, you didn't anticipate, you didn't look for. You, 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 you left home, headed for one place and ended up somewhere else. Something else on your mind and you ran into some mess. And all of the heartbreak that you've experienced, mess overcome, the blessings you receive, the good people you've been connected to, the bad people you eradicated yourself from, all of that, God has been doing something just to set you up. Set you up. There were some things I went through in times I didn't understand what God was doing. Then I got to the mess that was on my path and God showed me the reason I went through that is so I can handle this. Because in every life, there's some this and that. Watch this. Do you think you're still breathing God's air without purpose? That's a question. Let me drop that. Do you think you're still breathing God's air without purpose? When I stand here and, and, and do, do eulogies of loved ones and people who are part of this ministry, who are intricately a part and really moving components that really brings forth the success of the ministry. And then I, I realize that, God, you left me here to assume the responsibility because there's purpose in my life. I'm trying to let you know, I don't care what's wrong in your life. I don't care what's right in your life. For this moment, the good news is, though it all together, what God was using your problems, watch this, your places and even some people to set you up. He was doing all of this stuff to set you up, set you up. God does not exclude us from afflictions, but he does provide assurance for our afflictions. In facing life's foes, whatever we, they may be, you have to put your trust on that which you believe and know that he is greater than any foe. Come on, somebody say that with me. God is greater than any foe. Stronger than any strength. Powerful than any presence. Greater than any giant more triumphant than any tragedy, able over every adversity, bigger than every burden, triumphant over every trouble. Growing up, I remember Lazare growing up, one of my heroes, his introduction was so awesome that his enemies became frightened because he was faster than a speeding bullet. He was more powerful than a locomotive. He, he could leap over tall buildings with a single bow, can, can, can change the course of mighty rivers, bend still with his hand. He was Superman. He, he was Superman, but he had a weakness. His weakness was kryptonite. Weakness, kryptonite weakened him. But the God I serve, can I just tell you that? It, 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 can I get a witness? He, he said he's a God that does not have a weakness. He doesn't have a weakness and he has no kryptonite issues. I don't care what it is you're going up against. God has given you strength. You can press forward. And that's all you got to do. David has some historical context to rely on. This wasn't his first rodeo with Jesus. God had delivered him from a bear and a lion. He had delivered him from a jealous Saul. God had proven himself when he faced Goliath. 
Can I get a witness? He, God had kept him when his son Absalom, his political prodigy son, tried to overthrow his dad, his kingdom. God had given him victory over the armies of, that he faced. But when you think about what God has already done, how he has already proven himself, you can be encouraged that if you, can I get a witness? If you're down, he will not only lift you, but he'll take you over. God will take you over. Let me make another point. Here it is. He places a conjunction in our seasons of life. Look at verse 5. He says, this is your favorite. Weeping may. <laughs> Endure for now. Now, now here's what he says. He said that weeping may come, but joy will come. Now, you don't need to know the discipline of theology by Paul Tillich or, or the doctrine of the Masonese or anything like that. It's just may and will are two words that really conjunctively don't go together. Weeping may. Joy will. So he's saying that just in case you run into some issues, just in case you run into some problems, just remember trouble don't last always. Because the God we serve is the God who can turn it around. Sometimes life appears to have nothing but a series of nights. Nights in this context has nothing to do with time of day, but it's a season of life. Preach, Pastor P-O-L-L-A-R-D. Because life has its seasons. And we see that in God's word because Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says, tells us that life has its season. Solomon, the wise man, uses the word time, but then it really talking about life in various seasons. He says, everything that is a season, and a time to every matter under the heaven, and a time to be born, a time to plant up that which is planted, a time to die. He says, a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to break down, time to build up, time to speak. Time to be silent, time to mourn. This is where I'm trying to get to today, time to dance. Because God is not bound by time. Oh, he's not limited by time either. Is he in need of an extension of time? He oversees time. He operates on a different system. He's not paralyzed or penalized by time. He cannot be wedged or, or in a conjunction in the midst of one's circumstances. He says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in a moment. In Genesis 6 and 7, God is grieving that he made man. He's literally repenting of his creative activity because in verse number eight comes Moses but here then come Noah Noah says God no but Noah found grace God's rescue at Christ's expense in the eyes of God so when Paul was writing to the church at Ephesus in chapter number two verse two he talked about how they once walked following the prince of the air, the course of the world, how their passions were of the flesh carrying out the desires of the mind and of the body. But then in verse 4, gets placed there. But God, who being rich in mercy, because of this great love with which he loved us, watch this, some of our Christian lyrics speaks to that account because sometimes up and sometimes down, almost level to the ground, a season. Watch this. Trouble in my way. I have to cry sometimes. So much trouble, trouble in my way. I lay awake at night. But that's all right because Jesus. <laughs> I think you ought to just tell somebody he'll fix it. Tell him he'll fix it, he'll fix it, he'll fix it. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy will come. Watch this. You've got to believe that God has some joy juice for you that you can't get at the spirit store. I'll let that marinate. Because this joy that I have the world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. It, it, it may be delayed, but God has 
joy waiting for you. Maybe still in the stock room, but the package got my name on it. He can lift you out because he's in the lifting business. He can lift you over. Here's the final thing that I want to share with you. He can turn problems, verse 11, into praise. Have you ever heard anybody say, if you just praise your way through, if you just praise him, you'll feel better. Because God inhabits the praises of his people. He can turn my mourning into dancing. That's what he's talking about in the text when he says, from sackcloth to gladness. Our faith is not faith that is removed from the calamities and casualties and crises of life. Our faith is not one where we do not befall miseries and mistakes and misgivings. Our faith is not one where we are not sometimes crushed and crammed by the unexpected and unfair issues of life. Being on this journey of faith, you're going to get wounded. You're going to get weary and, and you will have some moments where you wonder where is God and why God seems to be so distant and so slow to come to my rescue. You have one of those Job moments where you wonder where is God. And you have those Abraham moments. God, let me help you out with your plan. You have those Abraham moments. Then you have those Elijah moments or Elisha moments. It's enough. I can't take no more. You have those Jonah moments where God ain't going. I ain't going that way. Here again in the verse, he can turn mourning into dancing. When you wait on God, through the pain, through the heartache, through the messiness of life. It may be all of that. Issues up, issues down. It may be hard and humiliating. It may be a pressurized situation. And you may be hurt and bruised and broken. But if you just wait on him, and endure it all. He'll turn your morning. I'm a witness. Into dancing. In other words. Your victimization will become victorious. Your trouble will become triumphant. Your tears will become a testimony. Your doubts will become your determination. Your problems will become your praise. Your grief. Will become your glory. He can turn. Things around. Because he will give you a new outlook. He'll give you a new uplook. Because even when the outlook is gloomy, the uplook is always glorious. He is God. He is the great I am. And let me just re remind you, before I leave you, he is God all by himself. And if you trust him, there's nothing God can't do. He's the great redeemer. He's the great reclaimer. He can lift you out, lift you over, and he can turn your problems into praise. God wants to do that for you today. Turn your worries into worship and your problems into praise. God is the God. He's the God who can turn things around. Wait on him and watch God turn your situation all the way around in Jesus name.
I just say around for me around for me yeah. it's turning around for me turn around turn around it's turning around for me father we thank you and we bless you that you are the God who can turn all circumstances, situations around for us. So God, we commend and issue all those things to your hands. You told us to cast every care on you. And God, as we do that, we just look to you, the author and finisher of our faith. So we just say now unto him who's able to keep us from falling, present us faultless for his throne with exceeding joy, be both glory, power, and even dominion. Be with us, go with us. We're blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed when we come and when we go. Be with your people this week, oh God. Let your word resonate within their minds to revive them in those low moments. To know that even in the darkest of nights, it's turning around for me. In Jesus' name, God bless you. See you later. Love you very much. You are cordially invited to the Education Forum, addressing the iniquities in schools to support two of Enon's own, panelist, Dr. Tristan L. Glenn, and moderator, Dr. Paquita Austin Morgan, Sunday, February 27th at 1 o'clock p.m. Please visit the link on the screen for more information.